Good afternoon, everyone. This is another in a series of explainers for Two Gray Beards. The topic today is the newly announced. The topic today is the just announced plan for the U.S. Treasury to engage in buybacks. And they have been working on this for a number of quarters with the group they meet with to describe to set up a plan for buybacks. So let's go through that. Firstly, the way we found out this information is that every quarter, the U.S. Treasury meets with a, is part of and meets and organizes and runs a group of people that are called the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee. Short acronym is TBAC. And the TBAC besides treasury staff, also comes from, on a rotating basis, members come from the buy side, so real money investors, including hedge fund investors, but also um, large mutual funds, large insurance companies, large banks, all the various buyers of U.S. treasuries represented. And also the sell side, which are the broker-dealers who facilitate the auctions each time a treasury is auctioned. And so that advisory committee meets regularly. And for about three quarters now, they've been talking about a buyback program. And now they've made progress and they announced that they're going to engage in a buyback pro program in, the, in 2024. So obviously that should have no impact whatsoever on markets today. It's 2024. That's a long way away. However, it does make sense to understand what it means because one way of doing a buyback, which is not part of their plan, but is would be an option for them if they put in their plan, is something that could be quite stimulative to asset prices. I'll come back to that. That's not what it is, but they have the ability to make it that if they choose to. So let's first talk about what it is. So what happens when a the Treasury buys back one of their government bonds or bills? Well, somebody sells it. Now they have cash. And the Treasury has less bonds outstanding. And that's it. That's really it. Now, the important thing, and this is why it's interesting given the Federal Reserve's actions when they buy bonds is unlike the Federal Reserve, who can pay for the treasury bond they buy by simply placing reserves at the bank entity that sold the bond or represented the seller of the bond, and that generates a deposit for the seller. And so now the seller has money and they can use it to buy other financial assets. And so the Fed uses QE to stimulate. In the Treasury's case, when they buy something, they don't have the money. In order to get the money, they either have to collect taxes, which, which they do, but they run a deficit. So they also have expenses against those taxes. So in order for the treasury to have money, they have to issue. So what's happening in a buyback is the treasury is buying a bond with one hand and selling some, a bond or something with the other hand at the same exact time. So that's how a buyback works. And then there's some subtleties around that. Firstly, why are they doing a buyback? And I guess the simple answer to that is, according to the press release we got today, uh, they have two purposes. One is to smooth their intra-month and intra-year quarter cash management. And the other is to provide liquidity, and this is where people start making extrapolating to this being stimulative, provide liquidity to the bond market where certain bonds 
are illiquid and for that reason trade at too high a yield relative to bonds that have similar maturities. And I'll come back to that. But first, let's talk about the cash management. All they are doing here is saying, gosh, we have some cash now because we've bought, got some taxes in and we our expenses are somewhere down in the future. But we know that given the way expenses are going to come down the pike and given the way tax revenues are going to come down the pike, we really don't want to have as big a maturity coming on this on a future date, a few weeks or a few days later. They can so the way they can avoid having a big obligation is to buy today. They may already be scheduled to issue tomorrow. And so all of this cash management repurchase activity is designed simply to deal with the fact that the government spends at a very different, in a different rate and timing than they receive. Like we pay our taxes in April. So, you know, a lot of taxes revenue comes in in April and no reason why spending spikes in April just because the revenue came in. And so they manage their cash normally. And for decades, they manage their cash by when they need cash, they issue bills. And when they have cash, they don't issue bills. The buyback just gives them, a, the, the cash management oriented buyback just gives them a little bit more flexibility in the way that all works. And for, I spent some time on this, but for you, the listener, it doesn't make a, di a difference at all. It's, it'll be completely transparent to the market. No one will care. Now, that takes us to the liquidity program. The liquidity program is complicated in the following way. You know, what it, what why does it make sense for the US Treasury to buy an illiquid bond out of the market? Well, here's the reason. So the most liquid bonds that exist are what are called on the run treasuries. And those treasuries uh, have been issued in the last quarter, and they have maturities of two years, three years, five years, seven years, twenty year, ten years, twenty years, and thirty years. And that's what they—that's the type of bond they issue. But each day, those bonds have a different maturity. And after a quarter, now there's a technical thing called reopening. I won't go in it, into, but after a quarter, the next bond that gets issued becomes the on the run. And this bond that's now off the run, doesn't trade with as much volumes, isn't preferred by people who want to buy, and can, even though it's just a quarter of a year difference in maturity, can have a different price. The next quarter, another bond is issued. And so now you have the new on the run, the quarter ago on the run, which is now the off the run, and the off off the run, sort of like off off Broadway. Anyway, um, that bond gets even more illiquid because you know the off the run's illiquid. The next off the run is even more illiquid, and any other bonds that have been issued in the past are even more illiquid. So here you have a three-year bond that was issued a year ago and now is a two-year bond and very illiquid. Okay? The people people stop trading it. The people who own it never sell it. The people who buy it buy the on-the-run two-year that gets issued. So they don't buy it. The one who owns it doesn't sell it. And the pricing gets out of whack. So what does that mean? Well, the government comes to auction a new two-year, and the off-the-run one-year-old three-year is trading at an elevated yield, people are going to look at that and say, hmm, does that make sense to participate as fully in the two-year auction when I can buy the old, old, old three-year 
at a higher yield. So what happens then? The fact that that three year, that old, 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 old three year has the same maturity as the new on the run two year costs the taxpayers more because it reduces demand for the two year because there's an alternative that's at a higher yield. So that's an arbitrage for the US government. They can go into the market and buy that old, 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 old three year and issue a new two year and take out the spread in yield, buying the low, the high yield US Treasury, selling the on the run and capturing a spread, a positive yield, which reduces the burden for taxpayers. So that's the incentive. That sounds good, right? Why wouldn't they always be doing that? And the answer to that is complicated. Um, the way I would describe it is if they were to do it consistently and regularly, or, well, certainly if they were to do it as a surprise, the people that get enriched by having the old three-year are hedge funds and broker dealers. They are the, the reason why the old three-year gets so high yield is because no one wants it. And so it ends up on the balance sheets of intermediate liquidity providers like broker dealers and hedge funds. And that spread, that off the run, on the run spread, which might be six, seven, eight, 10 basis points, gets levered a significant amount. And is actually that, that spread blowing out has actually been part of the long-term capital story where they had long, some inventory of long off the run, short on the run arbitrage, where because there was no natural buyer, when they had to look to sell to delever, the price dropped rapidly of the off the run and the on the run spiked. And in fact, if you go back to the COVID crisis, part of the reason why, allegedly, at least that was what was said at the time, I'm not sure about whether that's true, but what was said at the time was that part of the reason why the Fed jumped in so aggressively right during COVID is because of this levered players pain having this have there's tremendous demand for the thing they're short, which is the on the run, because everyone knows we're going into a government shut, uh, not a government shutdown, an economic shutdown, and interest rates are collapsing. So there's a huge demand for anything that looks like the on the run treasury, and there's no demand for the off the run, and the broker dealers and hedge funds that provide intermediate liquidity in the treasury market are in have the potential of getting destroyed, uh, which could create contagion. And so back then, off, you know, the Treasury went in, sorry, not the Treasury, in this case, the Fed went in to support liquidity in the market so that the, the Treasury market would, which had seized, because the only thing anybody wanted was on the run. And the thing that a lot of people, and so a lot of people were short that these broker dealers were short that and they had off the run that weren't didn't participate. Do you call that a bailout? Well, I think you could. But certainly if the Treasury Department said, hey, we're going to just go in and sweep up all this old off the runs because we don't like what they say about the price of our new auction stuff, which is really what the taxpayer has is going to bear, the people who are going to sell it to them are hedge funds and broker dealers. And so they really don't want the hedge funds and broker dealers to and by the way what they'll the if they announce a program a surprise program and there've been these and people don't know what to do when they announce a surprise program the market participants run in load up on the thing that the treasury is going to buy collapse some of the spread and sell it to the treasury at a profit and so the Treasury doesn't want to be in a position of 
of announcing a buyback and then getting front run. But if they're a regular participant with some consistency, just like they're a regular auction participant, the ability to front run their flow is minimized. And yet they still capture what is what what remains of a off the run on the run um, difference. And they get better um, prices for their on the runs that they auction to fund the deficit. But it still comes back to that same issue, which is how they pay for this buyback. And the way they do is they literally buy the off the run that's illiquid that ha and they issue the on the run that has a similar maturity. That's it. Now, is that QE? No, because private market has the same amount of bonds as they started with and the same amount of cash as they started with. And the treasury hasn't bought or spent, hasn't spent cash in the economy and hasn't received cash from the economy. The net of both players doesn't change. All that changes is there's that illiquidity premium comes out of the market. And I guess that allows broker dealers to load up again for on more illiquid stuff if for some reason it comes for sale. And that means that the liquidity in the treasury market is refreshed instead of sort of getting stuck with a bunch of illiquid inventory. So I think it's actually fairly good health. Like, like this is not, it's probably the, in my, in my, Part of hearts, I think the Treasury pays a lot of transaction costs when they sell their bonds. Issue, you know, when we when the bonds are auctioned in the in the regular market, they pay a fairly high transaction cost because they issue such size. And the buyback will cost them something too. And maybe they'll capture the spread, but are they getting a fair deal? Maybe not. So net net, I can't say that this is a great thing for taxpayers or a or a bad thing for taxpayers, but. Looks like they're going to do it. So who cares whether it's good or bad? Now we just have to see, is it stimulative to financial assets or is it not stimulative to financial assets? And that comes down to they're going to buy bonds and they're going to sell bonds. Okay? Sounds like not stimulative. And that's the answer. However, if they buy bonds, say 30-year bonds from the marketplace, and issue one-year bonds to the marketplace for the same net proceeds, they have reduced, because one-year bonds are so much less risky than 30-year bonds, they have reduced risk from, they haven't reduced cash, but they've reduced risk from the, from the private sector. And that is stimulative. And so that's when the Fed did it, they called it Operation Twist. Instead of buying a full range of treasuries across the entire maturity curve, yield curve, they focused on the long end of the yield curve and ignored the front end of the yield curve because they wanted to, for each dollar that they printed to buy these bonds, they wanted to have it have the most impact on yields. And so... By creating a buyback program, the Treasury has the ability to do monetary policy. Now, that just doesn't mean they're going to do monetary policy, but it does give them the ability to do monetary policy. And what I mean by monetary policy is the Treasury is not in the business of, of they, they don't have the dual mandate of price stability and uh, full employment they have a political mandate. And so if you gave them the ability to juice the economy through this QE-like use of the buyback program, well, they would potentially use it for political reasons, not for economic reasons. And more importantly, that's the Fed's job. So if they were to begin doing some form of, of buying long-term bonds and and selling, issuing shorter-term bonds that would be 
stimulative, the Fed would say, what are you doing? That's our job. And so there is some tension between what they announced and the, their role. And so um, when you read in carefully the results of the, the, the announcement, you'll see that there really is not an intent to do anything but collapse the spread of illiquid off-the-run bonds versus on-the-run bonds in the way I described, and not to pursue monetary policy goals. Doesn't mean they can't, because they can. But if they do, that is in conflict with their uh, the, the Fed's role. And the Fed's perfectly fine with buying bonds and printing money if the economy needs it. So it's not like, geez, we're doing something the Fed can't do. The Fed can do what if we need QE, the Fed will do it. And if we are doing QT and the Treasury says, no, I'm going to do some QE against that, you know, that's clearly a political decision. And the markets will know about it. And the political, you know, it, we'll see how the politics play out. So in closing, I'd say that this buyback is not very important, is decent policy with not a clear reason to do it, but also not a clear reason not to do it. Um, the cash management portion is totally sensible to do. Um, you know, you don't want to be in a position where you have to issue new new notes or you have too much money sitting around in the in the Treasury General account, and you know you're not going to have enough money in the future to not do stuff with that. So it makes some sense, but the QE idea is not what's happening. It could, but that's not what the plan's about. Thanks for listening.